it's just not fair. And it's just, it's heartbreaking to have to go and say that, Dad, there's a price on your life. I'm on Keytruda. That's the only thing that they know of that will work at the moment. So they just keep taking the drug until they can come up with something else. When we go back to our own workplace and we're dealing with somebody who has a condition that we're thinking, yes, well, my patient might have actually benefited from this drug, but the PBAC didn't actually fund it. And I was part of that committee which made that decision. That can be a, um, a difficult situation to be in. Is it going to distress patients if they have no financial means to fund it uh, when you know that potentially more effective treatment is out there? I think it's taken a big toll on our family. Everybody was quite worried at first. I'd have to reassure them that you know, I'm not quite dead yet. A few years ago, in his early 30s, Jay was diagnosed with a rare cancer of the eye called intraocular melanoma. When I was first diagnosed, yeah, I was uh, seeing an ophthalmologist. He took a look in my eye, told me that there's only one thing that grows in your eye, and that's cancer. In some ways, it's brought everyone closer together. Jay used to work a lot. He'd work weekends, he'd work during the week. He took some time out from work just to focus on his health and we went on holidays and things as a family, which is something we didn't really do before, uh, just making memories. We wanted to make sure we made the most of what time we have left as a family. The doctors were doing everything they could to try and help him. Jay's cancer is tough to treat. Chemo and radiotherapy aren't an option. We tried some other medications and they weren't helping and then they put me on Keytruda. Jay has been using immunotherapy drug Keytruda for a few years. It's just one of three types of immunotherapy drugs available in Australia. The drug manufacturer is covering the cost of his treatment on compassionate grounds. He's just received his 53rd treatment. Most people don't even last that long on the treatment, so he's done really well. Keytruda is one of a new breed of medicines known as immunotherapy drugs. It basically works by helping the body's own immune system fight the cancer cells. A 2017 clinical trial found 22% of patients with Hodgkin's lymphoma went into remission, but it's expensive. The drug company charges about $9,000 a treatment every three weeks, which can total over $100,000 a year. The government subsidises that cost for only some types of cancer. The field of immunotherapy is evolving so fast. While we know from the clinical trial that it can work for the patient in front of us, we can't access it. And I think the dilemma is how do we talk to patients about that? Is it going to distress patients if they have no financial means to uh, fund it uh, when you know that uh, potentially more effective treatment is out there? Dad was a very lovable rogue, you could call him. He was a very nice man. He'd give you the shirt off his back if you needed it. He was very generous. Dad didn't have a lot. Genevieve and her dad, Eric, were about as close as a father and daughter could be. His diagnosis of a rare type of head and neck cancer, adenoid cystic carcinoma, was devastating for both of them. Well, after I found out Dad had stage 4 cancer and I found out it was a rare cancer, one that um, hadn't had much treatment, no one knew much about it, I did a lot of research and I found that there were these immunotherapy drugs such as Keytruda that could help his particular cancer. But because Eric's cancer is so rare, Keytruda isn't subsidised by the government for treatment. For about five months, Genevieve got support from a charity to pay for it. But after that, she was on her own. I had to sit down with Dad and I had to tell him that there was no more money and that we couldn't get any more treatments. He was very upset that life pretty much had, a, had an end date now for him. Dad was in a nursing home when he passed away and it was not a very nice death. Dad was very sick and just after Father's Day Dad said his sort of last words to me being that I wish I could give you a hug, I wish I could hold you in my arms but I can't do that, I'm, I'm too weak. What was the last thing you told him? I told him I loved him, I sat with him and I, um, I laid next to him and I cried next to him and I told him I loved him and that everything he did for me was not in vain and that um 
He was my best friend. If you could afford it, do you think he'd still be alive? I think he would have lasted a lot longer. And I think the quality of life that he would have had in, in the end would have been a lot better than what he um, what, what ended up happening. It's just frustrating when he'd be sitting there getting that treatment at $9,000 and someone would be sitting next to him getting it for $38. And you look at it and it's just like, it's just not fair. The government subsidises medicines under the Pharmaceutical Benefit Scheme, or PBS. For anything on the PBS, the government will pick up almost all of the tab. Usually, patients only pay $39.50 or $6.40 for pensioners. Last year, the PBS cost taxpayers over $12 billion. That's doubled over the last 10 years. The group that recommends which drugs make the list is a panel of experts known as the PBAC. What they weigh up is the cost versus the likely benefits. I guess it's human nature that we all want to try something that might be helpful. Professor Jennifer Martin knows how difficult it is to deny treatment because money or evidence are limited. She's a clinical pharmacologist and used to sit on the PBAC. We work in a system where there is a constrained budget and we do have to always look at um, the maximal health gain for a population. When I struggle with that as a doctor because I have to make the best decision for my patient. Does it feel like a moral conundrum at times? The difficulty I think most clinicians have in that setting is that a decision is made on standard criteria, standard cost effectiveness analysis, but when we go back to our own workplace and we're dealing with somebody who has a condition that we're thinking, yes, well my patient might have actually benefited from this drug but the PBAC didn't actually fund it and I was part of that committee which made that decision, that can be a, um, a difficult situation to be in. This is a relatively new drug. What do we know about its efficacy? A lot of these new immunotherapies have, been, have come into Australia on what's called a fast track approval overseas um, and that means that they've been approved for use on much smaller amounts of clinical data. I guess the problem is that uh, it takes the government a long time to dis decide whether uh, from their point of view it's worthwhile uh, funding a, a particular drug in that indication. You can't pick and choose who can receive treatments when there's a treatment that's there even if it helps one life that's one life that you've saved and every life is worth saving. So do you think they should approve these drugs I guess across the board for, for cancer patients? Oh, that's a very controversial question. <laughs> From my perspective, I think the hardest thing is that the cancer types that have the most unmet needs are typically cancer types that are relatively rare. And if you have a rare cancer, then it's hard to gather enough evidence for PBAC to fund such type of cancer, which is desperately needed. Every time a drug maker wants a treatment subsidised for one specific cancer, the PBAC has to weigh in. Later this week, the group will consider how to subsidise these drugs for multiple cancer types in a way that doesn't overburden the taxpayer. It's like you're putting a price tag on who can live and who can die. It's, it's just not fair. And it's just, it's heartbreaking to have to go and say that, Dad, pretty much there's a, there's a price on your life.